Hi. 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 So, uh, hello. Uh, that looks like a bad clip. I know. Well, whatever. <laughs> I only worked at a sound studio for 12 years, so <laughs> you'd think I'd know how to use a microphone by now. Hello, welcome everybody. Yes. Um, my name is Matt Conant. Uh, I'm Michael Lecision. I'm Steph Uhas. I want to take a picture of you guys. Um, <laughs> and Go crazy. Yeah. All right, everyone. One, two, three. <laughs> You so, guys haven't had your coffee yet today. That's the problem. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, thank you for com for coming to the indie filmmaking for pennies panel. Um, just out of curiosity, how many people know of Nerd vs. Geek or Living in Eight Bits? Woo! Oh yay! Let's do a number. So, um, for those who don't know, uh, we have a couple samples of what we do. Um, if we could use the play all, and you'll see a couple of the different projects that we've worked on as a group, and then we'll talk about them, and we have a whole bunch of our cast and crew here, um, so it'll be a good time. So first, enjoy some Nerd vs. Geek and Living Evening. <laughs> so, uh, that's just an uh, example of uh, the different projects that we work on as a group. So... Gaff yes. tape to the rescue. Yep, don't mind me for two seconds. <laughs> First rule about indie film is gaff tape is your friend. Gaff tape is amazing. Uh, it will solve every and any thing that you ever need. Now so you're overselling it and it's going to not be able to solve this one. Well, here. Here you go. <laughs> this is teamwork. Hey! hey! Sweet. Um, Genius. So basically, so, yeah. Um, I guess uh, does anyone have questions in general about um, filmmaking? How to do filmmaking for really very little money or no money at all, which is usually how we filmmake, or um, anything about specifically any of the projects that you just saw. And to also mention for fans of both series, we have a lot of our cast and crew here. So if you're part of these series, stand up very quick so we can recognize. Yes, yeah. thank you, cast and crew. So, Caroline, Shelby, Ponner, Lori, Diana, Jovocop, Elizabeth, Sarah, Roro, Carmen, Jeff, Caroline, Lee. <laughs> I said Caroline twice, didn't I? Uh -huh. Yes. Um, That's okay. So, I think I got everybody. Did I miss someone? All right. So, by all means, questions about filmmaking, about our projects, what we do. Or Go questions to any of our wonderful actors and crew. I'll see. What's the cheapest good camera on filmmaking? Oh gosh, the cheapest good camera. Yeah, there's it's, kind is of there a, such a thing. <laughs> there, it, they exist. Um, and the plus side is these days, especially, um, cameras have gotten better for cheaper than they ever have been before. Um, I mean, general technology keeps improving, and you keep being able to get something slightly better every year than the last year for the same amount of money. But it's still a very hard question to answer because as money goes up, obviously there's some setting that it has that a cheaper one doesn't have, like, you know, under $1,500, you probably can't get cameras that shoot 24 frames a second. So if that's something you want, you need to go above that. And if you want to be able to do interchangeable lenses, it's going to be like $3,000 or more. So it just depends on what it is you're shooting, what you need it to do. Are you doing event videography? Are you doing filmmaking specifically? Um, you know, for web versus for theatrical. Uh. We've ended up with now, um, after we've, since we've been around a few years, we use the AF100s. Um, and for photography, we use um, the GH2 because um, the AF100s and the GH2 have interchangeable lenses. So we're able to get really clear picture. We actually, um, the way we decided to use this camera was we actually rented it first from like a local rental house to make sure we liked it. Um, we rented it with our friend um, James and we decided um, our production company and his production company would get the same cameras. So the Angry Video Game Nerd movie um, was shot with all those cameras. Um, all of Nerd vs. Geek was shot with those cameras. And I just, I think it, it looks really good if you can spend, how much are they now, like 35? Uh, Mike, you managed to get yours. I, I, I managed to get mine on eBay for about half the, the retail price, but you're gonna be looking between anywhere from 35 to 4,500, <laughs> but that doesn't include glass uh, or lenses. 
Right, the problem. Um, and batteries. And <laughs> yeah, so you can get with, a, with like the advantage for those who may not be filmmakers, if you have an interchangeable lens camera, it works kind of like a still camera. You can use different lenses on it. You can get different, like better depth of field a lot of the time, um, which means the background can be blurry and out of focus and it'll look a little more filmic. Um, but the disadvantage is you have to buy all the lenses, so then or rent them. Um, so and unfortunately, when it fast. unfortunately when it comes to lenses, you get what you pay for. Um, and if you ever looked on a on a lens, you'll see it. It will say like say it's a zoom lens. It'll say three point five to five six. And I'm sure how many people have seen those numbers before on a lens? Did anybody have any idea what they mean? Aperture. It's aperture. It's your f stop. And well. What happened? Well, the, the higher the number, the less light that goes into the lens, which then makes your image, you're going to need more light for your image, but you also get less depth of field. So, yeah, if you want something that looks really cinematic, you're going to need lower f-stops, but that costs more money. Since it's indie filmmaking for pennies, um, <laughs> the, what I would say is... It's more important that you have a good script and good talent than what kind of equipment you're using. Um, the, the first film I shot, I shot with a VHSC camera back in the day. And not that that film was particularly good, but the advantage of that film was I was able to look at it every day and see what I was doing wrong and make it a little better and a little better. And, you know, eventually with time, and I was working a day job and other stuff too, but. Um, you just kind of gradually upgrade the equipment just as you gradually improve your skills. Um, and it's more important to just get the technique down. And I've seen some really good looking stuff out of people that are using $500 DSLRs. Yeah. Um, I've, I've seen amazing stuff and I'm not a big fan of them, but I, I, I'm warming to the dark side of them. I've seen people <laughs> do amazing stuff with GoPros. And a GoPro, what, like $200 for the basic GoPro? Uh, maybe 400 for a more advanced one? Um, over the past couple summers, I taught a summer camp for film and video. Actually, some of my students are here. Woo woo! -woo. <laughs> um, and one of our kids actually made a horror film with a GoPro, and I would dare say it can go up against people who were in college making the same kind of quality movie. But again, it comes down to your eye, your skill. You can have. I've seen people shoot with red cameras who don't know a lick about shooting, and it looks terrible. But I've seen people shoot with Canon 7Ds or even Canon Rebel TIs and get amazing cinema-like quality. So a lot of it just comes down to your skill, your training, your practicing with it. Um, you know, any schmo can pick up a camera and shoot, but you got to actually know what you're doing. Frame composition, lighting, setting, uh, there's so many elements to it. I mean, you can make an amazing stuff with, with your iPhone if you know, understand those elements. And you have a good story. Yeah, story is important too. Yes. Um, um, any other questions? I saw another hand. What kind of general advice would you give to upcoming filmmakers on this day age? Find your talent um, and your story. Um, a lot of times, you have a you're very tempted to cast yourself or your brother or sister in your film, um, which is fine sometimes. Um, but there are actors in every single town that want to get exposure, want to build their portfolio too. So team up, like team building is the number one most important thing um, for aspiring filmmakers because a lot of times you go to school and they teach you how to edit and write a story and they, they might make you feel like you have to work alone, you know, schools usually train everybody to be directors, but that's not necessarily the case, you know, you might want to get involved on somebody else's production if you're a filmmaker and try being a grip, try being, you know, just an editor on somebody else's work. We've learned so much from each other since we've joined forces. Um, and now I finally feel like we have like a great team. There's a reason why, you know, we use some, some of the same actors over and over again because they become our family, they're dependable, but they're also, also professionals at acting. Don't, don't be, feel bad um, if you're not good at everything. Find out what your skills are, hone in on them, and then find people smarter than you to fill in the rest. Yeah, as, <clears throat> as an example, team building is important and especially um, on a low budget because 
it's free to just talk to people and find out what other people want to do. Um, I've learned over the years, I've edited a lot of movies, and I've learned I don't enjoy editing. I can do it, but it's not fun for me. There are other people that really enjoy doing it or that are better at me or have a better eye for it, that kind of thing. Uh, Mike's one of them. I don't know if he enjoys it, but he certainly is awesome at it, so <laughs> I, I, he gets recruited into doing that sometimes. Um, but I don't know. I do I just, enjoy it. Oh, good. Well, then I'll keep sending it to you. Uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, I find like my favorite part of the whole process is ideas and writing um, more than anything else. So that's when the funny thing is the thing that people come to us most with is I have an idea. And we're like, that's actually the one thing I don't need right now because we have this whole spreadsheet of just 500 ideas that we haven't found a way to produce yet. Um, but everyone else, like people at this point, you know, people will see your work and be like, I want to work with you for some reason. Something about what you do is good and I can contribute. Like, I happen to be good at lighting. I happen to be good at shooting. I happen to be good at whatever. And, you know, build your team and be open to that stuff. And to meet those people, um, there's really uh, two great ways to do it. Um, the number one way is to go to film festivals, local indie film festivals. Go and just meet people, you know, go to Q&As. If you like somebody's work, come up to them after the show and say, I, I want to help out. Um, if you can't get to local film festivals, um, which, by the way, we run one, shameless plug. Um, uh, I think it's happening next week, is it It not? is. <laughs> September 27th through 29th, we run the Philadelphia Film and Animation Festival. Um, you can find out information about that at project21.org. It's the word 20 in the number one. Um, it's all for emerging filmmakers. There's actors there, writers, musicians, people that all want to get involved with each other. Um, and it's a really great way to get your foot in the door. Um, if you come out to the event, find me and I'll introduce you around because I know pretty much everybody in the community. Um, but and it you, does work. That's how I became such yeah, that's good how we with started that. Uh, working. He actually won our film festival a couple years ago. But in addition to that, if maybe you can't get out um, to festivals, go online um, and try to join meetup groups, writers groups, filmmakers groups, and, and come out and see each other's work, critique each other's work. I met Matt on MySpace because we want to um, exchange screenplays, like back in 2006. So don't be shy. Are you guys uh, always going to be doing a combination of animation and, and live action, or are you going to go one way or the other at any point? Depends on the story. Um, animation sometimes is prohibitively expensive, um, only because it involves so much like just time making the characters. But then at the same time, sometimes film can be prohibitively expensive, depending on how much cast and crew you need. So it. It, what makes sense to the story, like the story always prevails, um, and we always try to go for the joke, uh, what makes it funnier. There was actually going to be um, an example of team building, and it also answers this question. Uh, the supervillain security solutions, the last thing we screened was originally written without that end scene, that end shot, the best shot in the whole thing, uh, and it was because you know, we were just, all of us trade ideas all the time, so the, the guy who was editing that, um, his name's Chris Pateko, he's not here today, but... Um, probably editing. He's probably us. editing something else, <laughs> but he saw the script and was like, you know what this needs is a clown balloon, and I was like, what are you talking about? I know what a clown balloon is, but please elaborate, and he's like, that's what the whole thing, like the Bowser castle, and I was like, I just saw a crazy guy laughing with like an out of focus something in the background that you don't really see. Like we see. would just green screen yeah, it, like just, we would just vaguely. Fake it. And he's yeah. like, no, this needs to be like the Bowser castle, and then for the next three weeks, he's like, he kept adding stuff. He did, he added, <laughs> there were like 15 drafts of that last shot, just because he's like, I added another ring of ghosts, and I added like this flame stick, and oh, look he, at the fire. He got so excited, he sent me the wireframes of the ghosts. <laughs> it's like yeah. so he's like, look at the wireframes, isn't this awesome? Oh so like, God. meeting people like that is helpful. So suddenly <laughs> there's a scene of animation in a thing that was supposed to be live action, and it's like, you know, you've got one guy that was just a guy against it would be a green screen, but it happened to be a red screen because the character was green and blue. That's and my fault. That's my fault. Yeah. <laughs> he actually, Chris asked us not to make the character green. If you do one thing, don't make him green. And then I forgot that, or I forgot to tell Steph or something, and she made it green. And then like it made it, yeah. If you ever like want to do green screen, don't make your character green, and like, <laughs> like also don't put reflecty things on him, <laughs> because like you see all of the reflection. Whatever color the screen is, it's gonna reflect off of the character. I don't know how he did it. 
All I did was set that up and said, uh, is this what you need? Okay. An animators are magical. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is uh, for everybody. Just in general, in your film career, short films, any episodes of any web series, what is the one thing that each of you are most proud of or you hold closest to your heart, like of your own work? That's a good question. Hmm. Oh, Going no. I don't uh, know. Go first, All own. right, I will go first. Um, it's going to be something that has uh, nothing it, to do with us. It's, it's going to be so, something from way before. No, we no, I, I'm just afraid <laughs> it's going to sound cocky. Don't go for but it. But I, I like to think that I'm, I'm an efficient worker, and that's probably the best way I could say. It. Like I'm dependable and efficient. Um, I, I mean, I, I'm not shooting what like you know Spielberg's cinematographer is shooting, but I, I at least like to think that what I shoot looks good. It has high production value, and that I'm very fast at it. I'm not someone who likes to spend a lot of time on set. And people who have been on indie film sets know that you could spend 10 hours shooting a half-page scene and like four shots. And I've been on sets like that, where for me, I go crazy if I'm sitting still at all while I'm working. And so I like to think that I, I shoot fast. It's a, it's a good, fast day and that my turnaround for editing is also fast while the quality still remains. So I, which project does that mean? I don't know. Uh, I can't say one specific. I think Elizabeth has something to chime in on that. I just wanted to say, last night we filmed something for Living in 8 Bits. Within an hour, Michael sent an email like, um, here's the rough draft. So <laughs> that is not typical. <laughs> not typical of most editors. It is for typical of Michael. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's one of the reasons I'll shoot something, and by the time I'm done shooting it, I'm so exhausted of looking at it and thinking about it that I'm like, I'll edit that next month or something. So when we started shooting Nerd vs. Geek, we didn't know who was going to edit it. It hadn't been officially discussed, we just wanted to get it filmed. Um, so after we shot the first day, Mike is looking twitchy already. He's like, so what do you think about editing? When are we going to edit this? What's happening? And I'm like, I don't know, sometime in the near future. He's like, I can edit it, like, right now. <laughs> so i like, guess what? You got the job, man. So, I, I, Well, and I'll, I'll also say, like, I mean, proud of, like, between Nerd vs. Geek, Living 8-Bits, um, I, one thing, one project that I've done lately that I was really proud to work on was the nerd movie, right. the Angry Video Game Nerd movie, and the fact that I was, I think I was given that in, in like a mid December, and I had all my scenes done by mid January for wow. that was uh, over a hundred scenes edited for a together. full feature, yeah. And so I, I like to think I'm proud of that because I, because then we were all involved with some pickup shoots for that that happened then back in April. And I don't think those pickup shoots would have happened without having a full cut of the movie because James had to see what he had. So I'm very, I, I would say I'm very proud of that. But I think I'm most proud of Nerd vs. Geek at this point. Like it's the thing we've worked on the, the, for the last year of our lives basically and there's a lot of scenes in it that are just hilarious to me and I should be bored of them by now but I'm not, they're still funny, so. I think I'm most proud of um, Nerd vs. Geek 2. Um, it, I really am I'm very proud of the writing um, through the whole season. We've built this world, and it's like you're only seeing the tip of the iceberg for it. And we've made this like family of our cast and crew. Like I want it to keep going. I'm dying for season two. I honestly don't know if financially we'll able to we'll be able to pull it off. But um, it's like one of the next things on my plate is to make that happen because everybody's so into it. <laughs> it's one of the few shoots where every single person that worked on it came on time, on set, didn't complain. Like it was just like this. Had their lines memorized. That's helpful. Except me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that I I told Matt and Steph multiple times. Nerd versus Geek really spoiled me, like because working on other shoots after that, uh, different projects, like people didn't know lines, people were late. I'm like, and I'm not. I wasn't having fun, and I think that was the best part about Nerd versus Geek. We were all having fun, and, and the, the same thing with eight bits too. <laughs> so. Uh, yeah. But I think sometimes you're the most proud of the thing that you worked on the last because you're at your best because um, you learn from doing. So, you know, I go back for stuff I made two years ago and I'm like embarrassed. But two years ago, I was like, this is the best thing ever. So. Uh, any other questions? Um, for everyone, I, uh, I've been having a hard time coming up with ideas, but uh, anything I'm going to do. 
how do you like for you or me Matt specifically come up with ideas? We talk. That's, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Lots of talky, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. I, I pitched Matt a potential Nerd vs. Geek episode for season two if it happens based on conversations I had at lunch at, at work. I don't know. And I he mean, liked it. <laughs> there are, yeah, there's a lot of, I don't know, ideas are just, uh, first, I, that's a tough one for me to answer because it's not, um, I just constantly, like, I'm, I would like to think I'm funny sometimes, so I'm just constantly putting scenarios out of, of thing. Whenever someone says something, I will try to add to that. And if it's, if it's a funny conversation, it becomes this whole weird scenario that never actually happened or would happen. But I'm like, I'm writing that down in my brain now, because even if it can't happen in real life, it could happen in a movie somewhere or in a script or something. That's how I do it. And then we add it to this Google Doc we have at this point of like 500 ideas, like I said. And then when we have something like, a client that wants a project, we just like go through what could what in here is a video game parody, um, and so we did a parody of Bowser, we did a parody of Final Fantasy um, for that one, and you know those are all based on existing franchises. Sometimes the ideas are more unique than that. Um, but I would say also if it's a thing where you want to be a filmmaker, but ideas aren't your strong point, um, or it's or that's where your stumbling block is right at the moment is just keep talking to people and see if anyone else has a really awesome idea that you want to get involved in as like a director or as a shooter or as mm -hmm. an editor and be like that thing is hilarious or it's awesome or it's dramatic or it's exciting um find a can writer I work yeah. on it can we work together on it i'll help you make that thing and I mean, help me make it like to put it in perspective like jeff who plays greg belmont and living in bits everybody knows jeff hi wait jeff <laughs> he, he um <laughs> he, he sent me a script for a short that he has grand plans for for a feature named Connie. And I, I've i been trying to write a feature again for a couple years and I just can't do it. I, like, I'm just strapped. And Jeff, he wrote it, sent it to me. I said, I want to shoot this. Yeah. And he did, and he said it more forcefully than that. <laughs> <laughs> this is happening, give me dates. I'm dates. going to shoot this. So, and it did. And it, and it happened back in March. We, yeah. we shot it. And within two weeks, we screened it with an Oscar-winning film. How cool is that? One of the things yeah, um, we true. do with Project 21 um, to help folks get you know, the ideas churning is we run a 21-day filmmaking competition. So um, we help people build teams. And um, you basically have three weeks to make an original short film or animation based on a common secret element. So it's basically a springboard. I think a lot of times, if, if you think I can make anything at all, it's actually crippling because there's too many choices. So if you start limiting yourself, like with the 21 day competition this year, we told everyone they had to include the secret element cell, C-E-L-L, -L, and it had to be under 10 minutes long and you have three weeks to do it. So now you have a deadline. Now you have a word that will start putting pictures in your head and a guaranteed public exhibition. For me, um, Sometimes when I come up with an idea, but then I'm having a hard time, you know, finishing it, I have to give myself a deadline. So I'll use film festivals or I'll set up even a fake deadline in my head, like aim for something to get it done. Okay, I need a draft by this to enter a screenplay competition. I need a finished film by this so I can enter it into an animation festival or film festival. So deadlines are really good. As far as fundraising, what do you guys, like, do you have, like, favorite fundraisers to use or is there, like, uh, more efficient ones than others that you could talk about? Because that's like a big uh, <laughs> Fundraising has never worked for me. Uh, <laughs> I've, I've done quite a bit of it at this point. Um, I hate it. If there's anybody that's a professional fundraiser, that's who we're looking to bring on the team. Yeah, please. Just, just an FYI. We'll take um, cards. <laughs> Business yeah. Card. Um, so I come from it. Um, there's actually sort of two tracks of if you're doing um, for film um, or any kind of projects. Um, if you're doing something altruistic, meaning something that's like nonprofit or a documentary or something that like helps society, versus what we do, <laughs> which is like not fun, helpful to society. Not helpful to society at all. Yeah, like silly Part fun things downfall. like this, like narrative <laughs> fiction stuff. Um, for for games for um, narrative fiction, silly things, for um, anything that's not altruistic, Kickstarter. And you have to go into it knowing you might fail the first time. Um, we needed to fail at having a Kickstarter 
to actually get our project done. Um, after our Kickstarter didn't hit its goal, we got about, um, well, I think we raised about like $7,500 on Kickstarter and, and um, we didn't make it in time. Our backers believed in our project so much when we said we're still going to make it, we just have to downscale it, you know, to do less episodes and less locations. They still backed us directly through PayPal. Um, a lot of people then also by showing, hey, we didn't meet our Kickstarter goal, all of a sudden started waiving fees. Like part of my budget was allocated to renting a laser tag arena. And when I showed them, I just, you know, killed myself the last 21 days trying to raise this money so I could rent your space and I can't do it now. The person got so excited by the idea of us being in there, they were just like, you know what, we'll just give it to you. And like, seriously, and that was like, I think three or $4,000 of my budget that I got waived because we tried and we had sort of a paper trail of listen we couldn't get the funding but we had enough passion that they they gave it to us saying you're a student or an indie filmmaker is awesome because you can get a lot of people to waive fees so that's number one is get your budgets down the best way to make a penny is to save a penny um and it also helps having a track record for sure for yeah. sure yeah if you can show people other stuff you've worked on um i mean one of the best one of the reasons we started working with Mike is, uh, like we said, he won the film festival um, in 2010 or something. He made this feature film that he managed to make out of pocket for like $3,000 or some ridiculously small amount of money you for don't a do feature that. film. No, <laughs> not recommended, but the fact that he could make it look as good as he did with that little amount of resources um, was like an indicator that like, okay, this guy knows what he's doing. Um, and then, you know, so we're all contributing resources to each other's projects now, and that kind of helps all of us on, on uh, funding. The, the thing about <coughs> fundraising is that you have to be transparent with your budgets, which means you have to make a budget. I'm really tired of independent filmmakers saying, oh yeah, I'm gonna make a feature film for $10,000. Like that is the thing we hear the most. When someone says that to me, it proves you didn't put together a budget, you just pulled that number out of the air because it sounds good. And you know what, first off, making a feature film for $10,000 is really hard. That's not enough money. That's pretty much just enough money for you to feed your cast and crew for like a three week shoot and maybe <laughs> buy like one piece of legit software, okay? Um, and you should have legit software, please. <laughs> um, but um, making a real budget, figuring out what your costs are and asking for it, and like basically you have to have your whole team buy into the fact that we're doing a fundraiser, you have to send it out everywhere, every day, and you need to plan your fundraiser as well. So it doesn't matter, I know you're probably asking of is Indiegogo better versus Kickstarter. I find Kickstarter is a little bit larger, so if when you're shown on the front page like we were, that's how we actually got a client um, to start funding our original short films, because we, weren't, we didn't raise an, enough money on uh, Nerd versus Geek, but we got discovered uh, by being on the front page of Kickstarter. So at the end of the day, we actually paid Kickstarter zero dollars to get that level of exposure and it and it, four four paid short films it, like and it's been four, incredible four incredible out. so you got to just put yourself out there um which whatever the platform is and if you use something like kickstarter um get some verbal agreements in advance because basically what we found if you don't get about halfway to your pledge mark within the first 48 hours people kind of just start to lose interest it's that time like like the first two days and the last two days are crazy that time in the middle it's awful. Nothing happens. You, nothing all, happens. Yeah. Do it in a shorter period of time is the other advice. And one other thing I'll say about fundraising too is that there are if that sounds horrifying like it did to me to like make a budget for your film, that sounds really boring and it is. But there are templates online you can use if you literally don't know what to even make it look like that says like here's how what the actors, where the director's line goes, or the editor's line goes, where the you know gaffer and the best boy and whatever, even if you don't have those things, to know the percentage generally of how much of a budget goes to who, um, that's a good place to start. And then if you know yours is gonna be costume heavy or it's not gonna have many actors or something, you can kind of tweak it from there based on how much money you think you're gonna have to work with. But 
And if you can't afford to buy a camera and need to rent one, it's really easy to come up with your budgets because you call your local camera rental house, like New York Camera or, or whatever is close to your house, and ask them how much would it cost for me to rent the AF100 with a bunch of lenses for a week, two weeks, whatever your. The other thing is put together a production schedule. <laughs> Don't let it drag on forever. When, when you're doing uh, longer films, uh, do you have any advice on ensuring continuity? <laughs> <laughs> you need a this continuity a, person. Yeah, this is a question uh, from a friend of mine who was involved in the first project I ever did. Um, it's really bad. It's not a good project. <laughs> so he means it in a nice way. There's a there's a scene. He's the actor. He was a writer and actor in this film, and now I get to embarrass him back. Uh, <laughs> there's a scene where we took notes from scene to scene what was supposed to happen. So I wrote down my note. Okay, in scene 76 or whatever, he's wearing his Adidas shirt. So when we film the second half of scene 76 later, make sure he puts the Adidas shirt on. So I told John, wear your Adidas shirt when we shoot this scene. And he's like, all right, and he puts it on. It's not until I get to editing I realize he had two Adidas shirts. One was white with blue text, and one was blue with white text. So he runs outside, and his shirt instantly changes to another color in the final edit. And I'm like, there's nothing I can do about that. So now he's making fun of me for continuity errors. This is, oh. this, this is where our call sheet will, and script breakdowns will go a long way. Because on a call sheet, it will say, all right, this is what the characters are wearing. This is what props they need for that day. Yes, yeah, so and, the actual um, answer would also be still photography and having oh, someone yeah. on set to just take a picture of what everyone was wearing in each scene so that when you go back to do that scene again or you have to do a pickup shot, you just take or, the picture. Or have an extra crew member just sitting with the script. Carmen has done this for me. He did this for me on my feature um, where he would, he would read the script along with the actor and write down, all right, they use their right hand here, they touch this with their left hand, and he'd make those notes, and it just having one person delegated to that. A lot of times it's someone on your editing team. So while you're shooting, have your editor on there and be your script and continuity supervisor. But just designate someone to it. You're, the director's not gonna remember, the DP's not gonna remember, and I can guarantee you the actor will not remember. <laughs> Just please, you have to like have one designated person for that. This is how crew builds up really fast when you realize all the people you need on set to handle all these different things. Yeah. All right, we have time for one more. Any problems with rights issues? Well, I was going to actually say don't wear an Adidas shirt because logos <laughs> sometimes can be a problem. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Um, no logos. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's really better to, you know, a lot of times when you're really independent, you're flying under the radar, so people don't care is like the true answer. So you don't have to go crazy with it, but honestly, it's better if you can avoid logos, if you can avoid... Um, the biggest thing is don't use copyrighted music at oh, all, yeah. at all. There are so many musicians. Um, I think one of them might even be here at Chiptunes, Guy Storm Blooper that we've been working with. Um, and we have our own composer and we have all these independent musicians that want their music in film so that they can get their name out there. With YouTube, they have literally an algorithm now. If you upload a film and it has copyrighted music in it, it will just auto flag you so because it just sees the waveforms so avoid yeah. it avoid it avoid it um sometimes using game footage can be a problem too again it depends on how indie you are sometimes you can fly under the radar you're not really supposed to <laughs> but i know some of us make a living off of that so <laughs> i think we're at one o'clock all right all so right. cool thank you guys so very very much if we'll anyone has other questions we'll be at the booth um in the back corner in the other room. thank you all so much for coming thank you <laughs>